I always love that song. I was hoping there was going to be the God's going to trouble the water. That's not my spiritual gift, so don't judge me for that. But uh, let's go ahead and pray before we jump into to this morning's lesson. God, we are so grateful for how powerful and awesome you are. We're grateful that you are a good God who loves us, who gives us your word. Father, I pray that this morning your scriptures would be elevated. I pray that your spirit would be loud. I pray that our hearts would be willing to accept what your spirit is going to teach us. Father, I thank you so much uh, just for everything you do, and we love you so much. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can open your Bibles up to John chapter 12. We're going to be kind of hanging out there this morning. Uh, did everybody have a good Easter last week? Yeah. You know, it, it, was, it was interesting. I, I literally was sitting down this week and thinking, wow, where did March go? I don't know if you guys are having that epiphany, but I, as a campus minister, I kind of work in semesters, and next week is finals, which is kind of, yeah, I know, boo, right? <laughs> but it, it's kind of a weird thing, so I'm like, wow, the semester is over. This year is almost half over. Where, where did that go? Jeez, time is flying, but uh, hopefully you guys had a great Easter uh, it was awesome for me. I got to spend some time with the Keeves during Easter. It was great. But we're going to be in John 12 this morning. We're going to kind of follow up to last week's lesson. So in John chapter 12, verse 20, it says this, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. You know, this passage, we read it last week, but this comes on the tail end as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, right? You know, we get this image of Palm Sunday as people are laying down the palm branches. They're shouting Hosanna, which means save, right? You know, these people for years and years had been oppressed, had been beaten, had been essentially oppressed by the Roman Empire. They had been clamoring for a savior. They had been claiming for a Messiah for years and years to come and save them from the Roman Empire. That's why they were shouting, or shouting, save us, save, Hosanna, because they were expecting that this Jesus who was coming into Jerusalem was going to come and kick out the Romans, was going to come and expel this violent force. He was going to bring the big army, bring the big revolution, and by force and violence, overthrow Rome. And that these people were expecting that he was going to deal with them. That the way to break the power of Rome, though, did not come in the way that they expected. The way that they were going to receive the salvation was not going to come by the way anyone expected. You know, last week I mentioned it was Easter. And we know that the change didn't come by the violent revolution. It came actually by Jesus deciding to surrender and die. And a revolution would spring out from that. It completely turned what we know of as a revolution upside down. Showing that even the power of death itself can't even beat the kingdom of God. You know, last week's sermon was entitled First Fruits. It was a sermon speaking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that there was a purpose behind it. There was something to accomplish with it. You know, one of the things that stuck out to me was this phrase that Jesus did not come back just for our entertainment. Jesus did not come back just for our entertainment. Rather, Jesus came back so that we might bear fruit in our lives. But in order to do that, church, just as Jesus says here, we have to be willing 
to lay down our lives so God can resurrect us. That again, salvation doesn't come from overthrow. It comes from surrender. You know, and this is a beautiful reality, right? Like Easter is this incredible picture of that we can have that salvation from everything going on in our lives, right? That oppression, death, sin, all that stuff cannot overcome the power of the kingdom of God. And Resurrection Sunday is something we often celebrate and we love and cherish and we should celebrate, right? However, I think that we can tend to just keep it to just that. Keep it to just the, I had my sins forgiven with that reality there. And I think that we forget the reason that Jesus even chose to give us life in the first place. Because we can tend to make the entire story of the Bible and the entire story of Easter just about how God wanted to give me the first fruits. How God wanted to save me from my sins. How I am dealing with oppression. How God is going to save me from that. If you can't detect the word I'm using a lot, it's me. We can tend to make it all about ourselves. And some of us, we can leave Easter reflecting on the things we want to change in our life, right? The character issues, improving on our marriage, wanting to become Christians, right? Like there's a lot of good things. However, it shouldn't just stay with making it about me. Jesus wants us to do something with those resurrected lives. Not for us just to enjoy the goodness of God's fruit just in a little bubble that's isolated from everything. Because Jesus' purpose is bigger than just our individual selves. John, or Jesus says here in John 12, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many. And we know that Jesus was talking about his life's mission and work, right? And his entire life's mission and work was all about serving and sacrificing for the benefit of other people. We see that all the time in Jesus' life. And if this is the king that we are called to serve, and the one we're supposed to imitate, then it should be expected that we too should have this kind of heart that Jesus had. That we should be willing and expected to lay down our lives for the sake of other people. That we too can be the kernel of wheat that sacrifices itself so that others may have fruit. If I can put this heart into kind of another way of saying it, I wanted to read this verse from Acts chapter 20, how Paul says it. Because I think that this is the kind of heart I'm trying to describe. In verse 22, he says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city... The Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The point of becoming a Christian is not just to have a personal relationship with God in a bubble. The point to become a Christian is to make our lives no longer about ourselves anymore. If you have gotten baptized and have made your commitment to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, but have made your walk only about how to better your own life and improve yourself, then I think you've missed the point of having a resurrected life. Because that's not Christianity anymore. That's just self-help. There are many self-help books out there about how to have a great marriage, how to parent better, how to give up addictions. But here's the thing. Christianity can help with all those things, right? We know that and we see that. But it's not meant to just stay there. Christianity is not just self-help. It's really to bring light into dark places and to live in a way to consider lives, others, or others' lives greater than yourself. Paul considered his life worth nothing to him, only that he might be able to use it to benefit other people, that they might know God and find Jesus. 
The point I want to describe this morning is just this. God's intent for giving us resurrected lives is to bring resurrection to others. God's intent for giving us resurrected lives is to bring resurrection to others. My first point this morning is leaving the gleanings. Leaving the gleanings. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Leviticus. Wow, that's a word. I need some water. Leviticus chapter 19. You ever get your mouth so dry it like sticks to the roof of your mouth and it just doesn't work? Now that I got that one out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and describe why I'm going here. You know, one of the things about myself you're going to learn is I'm a Bible geek, right? I, I love diving so deep into the Bible. You're literally going to think very differently of me now because you're probably going to be like, this guy is a total nerd. And you are right. I will own the fact I am a nerd, okay? Look, I watch anime. I love superheroes, right? And I love just getting into like the geeky stuff about the Bible, right? So one of the things I tend to look for, you know, when I study out scriptures about Jesus is I usually try to figure out what references is Jesus making from the Old Testament? One of the things I learned is that Jesus very rarely says something in the New Testament that doesn't come from the Old Testament. It's such a fascinating thing that when I can find those references, it's mind-blowing and crazy to me. And so I try to figure out what would an ancient Jew hear from what Jesus is saying? Like, why did he say that phrase? And when I was reading in John chapter 12, you know, when I saw the Greeks coming and all of a sudden Jesus says this phrase that if a kernel of wheat doesn't fall to the ground, I was like, why on earth would he say that? Because a bunch of Greeks came up. That was weird to me. And I, I tried to study it out and I tried to figure out, okay, where is, are those ideas present in the Old Testament? Right? And there was only one passage really I could make a connection to, and it was in Leviticus 19. In verse 9, it says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time, or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord, your God. Such an interesting passage, right? You know, it's an Old Testament law instructing the Israelites on how they were supposed to take care of the poor and the foreigners in their land. Basically, this idea of gleaning, we don't really use that word anymore. It's essentially, you know, this idea that if any of the uh, grapes or the grain from your harvest fell to the ground, you were not allowed to touch it anymore. It no longer belongs to you. And if you're harvesting and there's still, you know, fruit on the plants, you could no longer touch it anymore either. They do not belong to you anymore. And it was such an interesting thing that God says, look, those things are for the poor and the foreigner. You know, we see in the book of Ruth, this idea playing out, right? Ruth is from Moab, which is a enemy of Israel. Israel did not like Moab. They were seen as the enemy that God just had to wipe out completely, right? But when the famine struck, where did Ruth turn to? She turned right to Israel because she knew about this practice. Why do I bring this up? The reason is because when we see Old Testament laws like this, we shouldn't just ignore them because they don't technically apply to us anymore. We have to figure out why did God even institute a law like that in the first place? Because there's a reason God would say something like that. There's a reason that God would say it. It's not just because he's like, well, you missed a spot, so therefore don't go back, right? There's a reason for that. Because up until this point in the Old Testament story, the fall happened in the Garden of Eden, right? And God proclaims, I'm going to put this world back together. I'm not going to wipe it out. I'm not going to start over. I'm going to put this world back together. So he chose this guy named Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to give you descendants more than you can count, right? I'm going to give you offspring more than the stars in the sky, more than the grains in the sand. However, I'm not just going to give you that just because I want to. There's a purpose behind that. I'm going to use your people to be a light to the nations, is what it says. Later on, Moses frees these people from slavery in Egypt 
And he says to Moses, he's like, I'm going to create this nation to be a kingdom of priests. God, throughout the narrative, used the people of Israel, not just as a nation. He's like, these are my favorite people right here, and I'm going to bless them, and they're going to be awesome, right? There's a purpose behind it. Israel was meant to be the way that God was going to restore the world. They were supposed to be the light to the nations. They were supposed to be the kingdom of the priests, the people who were going to be able to help people restore themselves back to God. That was why. That people could look at the nation of Israel and go, there is a true God of the universe. I see his character qualities. I see how he acts. That's what truth is. To do that, though, Israel had to stand out. They had to be placed in the crossroads of the world, as some would say, and one of the busiest trade routes between all the major nations at the time. They had to not partake in some of the practices of the other people. They had to showcase who God was through their lives, right? And this law in Leviticus is just one example of how God wanted them to act. That really this practice was to try to help Israel not be a nation about themselves, but about a nation about other people. That was not just an option to Israel, but it was an expectation that they knew their role in the world and God's plan was not just to be there to enjoy his good fruit, but they had a partnership with God to put together the world. God was trying to teach Israel to be a people not focused on themselves, but rather a nation that was focused on others. However, one of the things that I, I learned from the story, and I even think about my own self, is that this seems really great, right? Really ideal, but I think basic human nature wants to teach us to lean into being inwardly focused, only worrying about how can I maintain my own needs, my own self, and really, at, at the end of the day, I've learned from myself, it's just my own selfishness. And this isn't what God's people are called or meant to be. God calls us to be like Israel, to use the blessings we have. You know, you think about your time, your energy, your resources, to be a light to other people so other people may know who God is. And I think, again, what tends to get in the way of our own hearts wanting to do that, right? Because that's the ideal I think, again, the thing that prevents our hearts from that is our own selfishness. Because we know that we should be investing in these kind of relationships, right? But I think our selfishness creates, quote-unquote, important excuses to not do those things. Why I can't give my time. I'm too busy with X, Y, Z, right? I can't give of my energy. I'm too tired. I have all this going on. My mind is racing with all these things. I think that we can think about our resources. Ah, I can't give that. I can't do that because I need to take care of my needs first. Y'all with me on that? Yeah. Because I think that we can allow selfishness to cost us from investing in those kind of relationships. One of the things I've learned about selfishness is that it always withholds or takes from other people in order to elevate ourselves. You know, Perry last week shared about a moment in his marriage that uh, he was not as good of a husband as he should be. So I thought it was fitting that I should share about a time I was not as good of a husband as I should be. Right? So I haven't been married that long. And, you know, I remember uh, when I was going through premarital and I was reading books on marriage, like, I'm like, I want to be the best husband I can be, right? And I read about all, like, the chapters about how selfishness can ruin your marriage, right? Right? And I was like, I'm never going to be selfish. I'm going to be perfect in that, right? No way am I going to do that. Well, the other week, <laughs> it was my day off. It's Monday. I only get one of those days a week, right? And the weather's nice. The birds are chirping. You know, it's not too hot, not too cold. I'm like, oh, what a great day. My day is going to be, I'm going to sleep in. I'm going to watch a good show. You know, when it gets nice and cool in the evening, I'm going to go play some disc golf, right? Like that's my day. That's my perfect ideal day. And then I'm sitting on the sofa and my wife turns to me and she's like, 
Hey, babe, can you come with me grocery shopping today? <laughs> Some of you guys are already snickering because you know where this is going, right? <laughs> so I know I'm not alone in this. But I remember in my mind, the thing that popped in my mind was the last thing I want to do is go to Walmart on my day off. <laughs> and I remember I sat there for like 45 minutes to an hour trying to come up with every excuse in the book to not go to Walmart. And then the thing was, I still went to Walmart anyways because I had no good excuse to not go. And the thing was, I couldn't go to Walmart or I went to Walmart, but I couldn't go disc golfing afterwards. So the entire time in Walmart, I had a terrible attitude about it. I was listening to a disc golf podcast. I'm like, well, if I'm not going to play disc golf, I'm going to listen about disc golf. I don't have a problem. <laughs> you know, and I remember, I, I, you know, my wife would tell me like, hey, can you go grab such and such? I'm like, okay. And I would go get the thing, come back, and she's not having a good time. And the entire time, I, my, in the back of my mind, I, I probably didn't think this in the front of my mind, but in the back of my mind, I was literally like, I'm going to make it so that this is not a pleasurable time so she never asks me again, right? That's my selfishness, right? Because my whole goal was to get even in that case. Like, if I can't do the thing I love to do, then you can't have nice things either. How immature of me, right? But I say this to say, our selfishness is what takes from other people. Instead of giving my wife a nice time out grocery shopping and making the time pleasurable and helping her, I decided to take from that moment because I didn't get my way. My needs didn't get met. I wanted to elevate myself or justify myself in that case. That's what selfishness does. It either takes from people or it just withholds giving to people because we're the most important thing in our lives. And I think at times, selfishness gets into our relationship with God and makes all of our Christian walk purely about how can I get my needs met? What can God do for me today? I'm grateful God saved my sins. Thank you, God. I'm going to live my life how I want to. All that other stuff is optional. And, you know, I'll do it every so often when it's convenient, but I'm not going to make my life about God's mission. Those are the ways that selfishness can reign. And here's the thing, guys. God's kingdom can't be a place where selfishness reigns and it causes us to become a church that's inwardly focused. We've been given the fruit of the resurrection. We've been given a new life. My question is, church, where is our heart towards helping other people know God or really another way of saying it? Have we become selfish with that fruit that God has given us? Have we chose to hoard what God has given us just to ourselves because it's so good and so great? We don't want to give it to anyone else. We don't want to share it with anyone else. Because I think the lesson that God was trying so desperately to teach Israel and what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and his example throughout his ministry and even his actions on the cross show us that we shouldn't be a people who are about ourselves but we should be people who are looking for the benefit of others so that others might know God. A question this morning is how can selfishness cloud my heart towards helping other people know God? So the question becomes, if we know selfishness can cloud us and we want to repent of that, we want to remove that from us, what does it look like to be people who share the fruit that Jesus has given us. My second and final point this morning is workers of an answered prayer. You can turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, verse 35, it says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers 
are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, it says Jesus was going throughout the towns, the villages, teaching people, healing people, you know, doing his thing, right? We see this all throughout the Gospels. Jesus is working his tail off to bring the kingdom to as many people as he possibly could in those three years. You know, at one point, Jesus turns to his disciples on one given day after being moved to compassion by this crowd, seeing that the state they were in, he tells his disciples very clearly, there's a lot of work to be done. But there are few workers who are willing to do it. The Bible here describes this crowd like sheep without a shepherd who are terrified, harassed, and utterly helpless. And I think we think of sheep in terms of the cute little creatures who are pure and white and you know, he's like, oh, Jesus is calling them like pure. And that's how he's thinking of them, right? Which Jesus does think of them like that, but that's not why he's calling them sheep in that moment. Sheep are probably animals that if they didn't have humans guiding them, they would probably die off within a couple years. That's because sheep, for lack of a better term, are probably some of the most foolish animals out there, right? Have you guys seen sheep videos on YouTube? I've looked at some of these, like I've read, a, I've read a book a while back, of A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, where he talks about this idea of how uh, these sheep analogies in the Bible. And he was telling us about how if a sheep literally tipped itself over on its back, it literally cannot put itself back up on its feet. And it will die within an hour if the shepherd doesn't come and tip it back over. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? And if a sheep is eating grass, it will continue to eat it until there's dirt there and then eat the dirt. Like the shepherd actually has to point them like, no, that's good food right there. Like sheep get stuck in weird places. If one sheep runs out of the sheep pen, every other sheep is going to run out of the sheep pen. It's kind of ridiculous how it works, right? And sheep, you know, they get attacked by wolves and coyotes and all sorts of things, right? Sheep need shepherds. Sheep are harassed and helpless without shepherds. And that's how the state of the people were. Jesus says, they're just like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know what they're doing. They're, they need hope and help in their lives. They're seeking for answers. They're desperate for the truth. And this is the scenario that happened everywhere Jesus went, right? Literally, there are times Jesus is encountered by thousands and thousands of people. And he's like, hey, let's go sail over the lake so that way we can maybe get away from some of these people. And they chase them across the lake, right? Like they were needing help and they were desperate for answers. And Jesus said, because of this reality, there needs to be more workers in order to help with this. Now, I think often about this reality, right? This is one of the scriptures I ponder on a lot because I think the world is still broken. People are still harassed and helpless. This isn't just a Jesus problem that he dealt with in his day. People are still broken. You know, I, I study the Bible with lots of people on campus and I hear stories of kids who have gone through uh, families of divorce, brokenness, stories of mental health, still tanking, suicide rates increasing, abuse of all kinds occurring. And all these things I say speak to a world that is still harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, Jesus says here, we need more workers to help with this reality, right? And I think sometimes we can think about it like, okay, I can do what Jesus says and pray for that, right? I could pray for our ministers. I could pray for our missionaries. I could pray for basically other people to be equipped to go do that work. But I think often not, we leave that prayer there and we don't pray that God would make us into a worker. We don't think of ourselves as a worker. We tend to think of oh, other people will do that work and be that reality, right? And we view only a select few people as the answer to this prayer to provide workers and view ourselves as more just kind of a support role, right? We will pray for them. Maybe we'll give financially to them and, you know, we'll encourage them, maybe invite them to a meal every so often at our house, but 
We don't really view ourselves as the same kind of worker. We don't view ourselves as the answer to this prayer. Because here's the thing, church. The way God provides more workers in the harvest field is by giving the fruit of the resurrection to some of the broken so that they will tell others how good the fruit is. That's how he provides more workers. It's not that he's going to send some angels down here to help us. He chooses us to be that reality, to answer that prayer. Because if you've tasted the fruit of life and have become a Christian, then you are part of this prayer being answered. And here's the thing, you might as well be the answer to someone else's prayer. Church, we have to view ourselves as this way. We have to choose that we are the reason, or not the reason, but we are the way that God is going to provide the answer to that prayer. We have to become the workers in the harvest field. You know, one of the things that's always sobered me, I had one of these moments as a uh, campus minister. This is years ago, uh, one of my former campus ministries. We were at a Bible talk. And I I think a lot of times we can think about, well, I need to be uber spiritual or I need to be in this high place in order to help somebody and, you know, invest in somebody like this. But I remember there was this guy, you know, he was kind of on the fringes in our campus, kind of not doing too hot spiritually, kind of struggling with this idea of believing in God. But he came to Bible talk one day and he was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to share with some people. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to really give this a shot. And he shared with this guy and this guy came to Bible talk and uh, he sat there and he was like, is this like a kumbaya circle or something? Like he said that and I was like, okay, what a weird comment to say, right? You know, because he he didn't really know what like Jesus or the Bible was really. And uh, I remember one of the guys got time with him later and he calls me and he's, and he's like crying on the phone. I was like, why are you crying? And he was like, I got on the time with that guy. And he told me that if he didn't get invited to Bible talk, he was on his way to end his life that day. And I share that story because I remember just the chills going down my back that day. That people are so broken and don't have hope. Gosh, people don't have hope. And it's one of those things that you never know how God is going to use you to impact somebody. (laughs) You never know how God can use you to help somebody when they're in the most desperate place in their life. You know, and that guy who, who shared with him, it, it impacted him immensely to hear that, man, I'm in this place spiritually that I am, but God still used me to do something with this guy. You may very well help someone save them from a future of getting a divorce later in their life, save them from an addiction, save their kids from going through a traumatic marriage. All you have to do is teach them Jesus. Because if they learn Jesus, their future reality could be very different than the reality they're going towards right now. Jesus gave you the fruit and he calls each one of us to do something with that fruit. Not just to enjoy it for ourselves, but to use it to benefit others. Church, what are we going to do with that? So the question is, how do we become the workers that Jesus calls us to be? Here's just a couple practicals that I thought of. I think one, I I thought about how Israel had these things. They had practices and rhythms that kept them outwardly focused. You know, I I don't know if I put in parentheses up there, but on my notes, I put hospitality week. Because I think that church, we can easily slide back into our selfish ways at times, right? We need things that are going to remind us to stay outwardly focused. We need things that are going to keep our heart in that place. And Hospitality Week is a great way to do that. Having someone in your home that is a non-Christian or a non-member of the church purely to invest in friendship with them. To show them your life, to share your life with them, to share the fruit with them. And I think we have to be committed to this practice because if we're not committed to these kind of practices, we're going to forget. We will forget because we're humans and we need those practices. I think number two, Pray that God would lead you to hearts that are longing for him. Or even to pray that God would change your heart to be a worker in the harvest field. Prayer works. Pray that God would use you and change your heart to want to be used by him. And I think number three, investing in friendships that you can be a light in. 
I encourage people to really have one or two people that they are investing in that are non-Christians, that are totally way away from God, purely so you can be a light in and purely so you can love them like Jesus loved the lost. Because we need to invest in those kind of friendships. We can't just treat people like they're a quote-unquote Bible study or a visitor that's coming to church, right? I know we have terms for those things, but we can't just treat people like that. They're friends. And we have to actually love them like a friend would. We have to eat meals with them. We have to hang with them. We have to spend time with them. We have to go do fun things together. We have to do things that Jesus would do, which means investing, which means it's going to take time. It's going to take energy. And it's going to take effort to do that. But we can't do any of those things if selfishness still reigns in our heart. We have to be people who are not about ourselves, but about the benefit of other people question I want to pose this morning is, how can I be a worker in the harvest field this week? How can I be a worker in the harvest field this week? Because remember, church, God's intent for giving us resurrected lives is to bring resurrection to others. We all have an expectation to do something with the lives that Jesus has given us from his workings on the cross. And if we allow the fruit of the resurrection to totally change our lives from the inside out, we can't stay on the sidelines anymore. But we have to be compelled to be people who are willing to go out in the harvest field to do the work. To help others know God, to redeem this broken world in every way that we possibly can. Or to say it another way, church, in Matthew 5, verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Church, we can't be a place that we hide our light under a bowl. Let's not be a church that's lighting everything up here in the church building, but we keep it to here in the church building. Let's be a people who are willing to bring light into dark places and willing to be a kernel of wheat that falls to the ground for someone else. How will you share fruit this week with others? I'm gonna go ahead and pray. We'll have time to reflect on communion. Father, we are grateful for how you give us fruit, for how you've given us life and resurrection so that we can thrive and have great lives. God, we're grateful that you love us so much. I pray that we could love people the way that you love people. The way that you see how people are broken, God, let us see the way people are broken. Let our hearts long to be people about others, not about ourselves, God. Pray that we can use what you give us to further your kingdom to the ends of the earth and to glorify your name higher. We love you so much, and we thank you for your son. It's in your son's and we pray. Amen.